All right, here we go. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Welcome okay. in, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Teach LA, Teach for LA. It's great to see everybody this fine morning. Good morning. Are you Miss Rosemary Red? I'm Rosemary right here. I'm David. Hi, David. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Okay. Rosemary, Rosemary let me know when you want to start. You can start. I'm going to make Joanna co-host here so she can control things if necessary. All right. Yeah. Well, good and morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Teach for LA. I'm Leah Martinez from Rio Honda College, and I would like to introduce you to our speaker for today for Transformative Teachings, Culturally Sustaining Pedagogies, Rosemary Wren from Cuesta College. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Yay! Well, and I've got to give a plug too. We're so proud because Rosemary, um, Dr. Wren just got her um, doctorate pretty recently. So we got to make sure we throw in that doctorate at the front. That's right. Well earned, <laughs> well earned, Rosemary. Thank you. And I am so grateful to Leah and Renee for always um, putting these events together where we get to talk about things that are important to us about about teaching and we would love to know who you are and where you're coming from or where you're joining us from today so if you don't mind dropping that in the chat so that we can um, just kind of have a good understanding of who's in the room with us today and um, my name is Rosemary Wren I use she her pronouns I work at Cuesta College as the lead faculty for elementary education, and I also get to work over at Cal Poly Slow. So I literally go back and forth between the two colleges, and it's been really cool because I've been able to um, communicate between the CSU system and the community colleges and to really see how, understanding how each one of them works, it, it's helping me serve my students better at both colleges. And with me today is one of my awesome students, Joanna. She's here to help um, with the chat. And she is one of my students at Cuesta College who has um, completed her bachelor's and is getting ready to apply to teacher preparation programs. So I'm really excited to have her here today. Um, so throughout the session, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. I am, I have a, long slide deck that I don't plan to get all the way through, I'd rather answer the questions that are important to you. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. And hopefully this will all work the way it's supposed to. I have not been having great uh, experiences lately with technology is what I'm going to say. So um, if you could in the chat, please go ahead. And um, like I said, uh, your name, where you're joining us from, and you know what what age group are you looking to teach? And what I have to share with you today is my understanding and my learning about culturally sustaining pedagogies. I am not an expert. I am a, I am an ongoing, always learning scholar. So what I'm sharing with you today is, like I said, my best understanding um, of this field and. So uh, the link, I can drop the link for the slides here in the chat. So if you want to follow along, you're welcome to do so. Let me find it here. No, nope, it's not going in. Hold on. Like I said, OK, there we go. So you, um, you're welcome to copy those slides and all that. Um, I just ask that you give credit to the scholars that I've cited throughout. Um, and before I get started, I want to acknowledge that the land that I am on right now and that my both colleges stand on is the land of the Yaktichu Tichu Yaktalhini Northern Chumash. They are the original, current, and future caretakers of this land and culture of the area that's occupied by Cuesta College and Cal Poly Slow and my home. I actually, my home is on the site of one of the largest villages. Uh, of the of the historical Chumash and um, 
one thing that I ask you to do is to find out what land are you on? Uh, and you can do that. I don't have a link here. I'm sorry, but I'll find the link for you to share with you. Um, yeah, and can everybody mute, please? Yes, yeah, thank too. you. Just good. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so. If you want to make me co host, I can start muting people. Yeah, I'm going to mute all. There, hopefully. That did it. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, okay, I'm not muted. All right, so anyhow, I wanna share with you that this weekend I, I attended a memorial for the, the elder of the Northern Chumash tribe here in Avila Beach. And it was a phenomenal experience and really reminded me that the land that I am on is not mine. Uh, and that in order to do more than just give you a land acknowledgement. Um, I want to encourage you to look into the land you're on and find out how can you support the work of the community that has been taking care of your land from time immemorial. And one thing that I'm doing here and I wanna share with you because I hope you'll join me in supporting the Chumash Heritage, um, the National Chumash Heritage Marine Sanctuary proposal that is currently up for approval uh, and it's been a labor of love and the elder that just passed away, it was his um, life's work. And um, a good friend of mine, uh, it's her family. And so it is possible to contribute back. And I know this is a, a workshop on education, but it's important that we walk our talk. And that's really the first step in culturally sustaining pedagogies is walking the talk and following through on these kinds of reparations, whatever we can possibly provide. Um, so if you're interested in that, I, I will get the link and um, share it with you at some point here. So this is me. I, as Renee just mentioned, I just completed my doctoral program and I see one of my colleagues, Dr. Sam Rodriguez has joined us as well. And we um, completed a program in educational leadership with an emphasis in social justice. Uh, as a white person, I feel it's really important for me to find out how can I undo uh, or dismantle some of these structures that have put me in a privileged place and have left a lot of my students and um, colleagues out of the out of access to things. So this is one of the ways that I choose to do that. My research is in how to better prepare teachers to navigate issues of race and identity in the classroom and recruiting and retaining a more representative teaching force. Um, so again, if you um, if you want to show if you want to turn your camera on, that's great. I also understand days where we just can't deal with a camera. So it's up to you. And then if you haven't yet, please let us know who you are and where you're joining us from. So culturally sustaining pedagogies, I will share with you some definitions. And right now, um, some of the premier work in culturally sustaining pedagogy is coming from Drs. Paris and Aleem. Um, and, and this is straight out of their work, which is called culturally sustaining pedagogies. And these are ways of teaching that serve to perpetuate and foster, so sustain the linguistic, literate, and cultural pluralism as part of schooling for positive social transformation. So to unpack that a little bit, we're talking, um, I'm sh we're talking about really encouraging and celebrating and weaving into the curriculum activities, learning opportunities, dynamics that support children with their language and their culture and really beyond heroes and holidays, make it just part of the fabric of the classroom. Uh, another, uh, ah, sorry about that, my mouse does that. Another um, way to look at it is that culturally sustaining pedagogy exists wherever education sustains the lifeways of communities who have been and continue to be damaged and erased through schooling. Uh, and, I get passionate about this because when I really think of what this means, when we talk about erasing, 
we have in this country, in, in this country that is now called the United States of America on this land that wasn't ours to have in the first place, a deliberate effort to erase entire civilizations. It's not funny, it's mind boggling. Um, so as teachers, what can we do about it? We can make sure that our own children's, our own students' um, lived experiences are valued and validated and celebrated and incorporated into our curriculum. So uh, I'd love to see what is something that you wish your teachers had known about your ways of knowing and being. In the chat, type in the chat, um, oh, Here's the slide deck again, if people want that. Uh, but while, um, so what I'd like you to do is think of something that during your schooling, you wish that your teachers had known about you or had valued about you. Um, and it could be anything from the fact that you had a yellow kitty cat at home to the, they, you wish that they knew what an awesome cook your mom was. And so go ahead and type that in the chat, but don't hit enter yet. And this is something I call a waterfall. It is not my idea. I can't remember whose idea it was, but it... anyhow, so go ahead and what is just something you wish? Maybe you wish your teachers knew that you had um, a heritage that wasn't obvious by just looking at you or that you had a different home every night. All right, so three, two, one, hit enter. Okay. Oh, sweet, okay. All right, so we've got, okay, about the Japanese internment camps because the, yeah, and so Sarah, I'm with you on that. There is definitely a deliberate effort to um, take the wealth away in Japanese, in the Japanese farmers and the property owners that were sent to internment camps out of, um, yeah. So the pressure of doing well in school from my parents. I wish they made left-handed materials. Yes, um, not all kids have two parents living. Yes, absolutely. African-American culture is more than slavery. And that's part of what we're gonna talk about here today. My talents and accommodations. Um, that I loved school, that Mexican contributions to this country being Mayan, what an incredibly rich culture and traditional um, heritage that is, that I was raised by a single mom, that my Spanish language is an asset. There's a whole nother conversation to have about the ratio and linguistic perspective on bilingual education that we could go into. Single mom, challenges at home, trying my best. I was dealing with anxiety, how offensive the anti-Semitic remarks. Oh, that, and those are woven into our uh, curriculum. All of these things are reproduced in our curriculum. Um, that hard childhood. Okay, so I hope that you will all read what your colleagues have been adding in here into the, the chat. These are incredibly, um, these make you vulnerable. And I, I thank you so much for trusting this community to share these, these important things. And so all of these, all of these things that you're talking about, that art is a career path, that my home language was, was used throughout school. And I did my teacher education and I did my teacher training in, at, down at UCLA. And I was in a school in Koreatown where it wasn't Spanish, but multiple dialects of Chinese and Korean that were being spoken. And so just what an incredible wealth that would have been to celebrate instead of rigidly putting kids in boxes and expecting them to um, only communicate in Spanish. The invalidation and erasing all other people's history within history class. And Claudia, with that, we're gonna dive into this a little bit more. So absolutely, all of these are extremely valid. And again, these point to the need for culturally sustaining pedagogies. So you've probably heard about culturally relevant and culturally responsive pedagogy. Culturally sustaining pedagogies, the first chapter of the book is one of the most loving critiques and encouraging um, let's build on a foundation rather than um, taking away from culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. Culturally sustaining pedagogy embraces all of these. And Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, who happens to be a scholar hero of, one, of mine, she 
is the first person who, who started talking about culturally relevant pedagogies and bringing children's culture and ways of knowing and being into the classroom. And Zaretta Hammond went on to talk about culturally responsive pedagogy and the brain and actually looked at brain science to validate that this is so important that bringing children's experiences into the classroom only enhances everybody's learning experience. And then um, Louis Mall and Norma Gonzalez and, and a whole group of people talk about funds of knowledge. Funds of knowledge are your ways of knowing and being that for whatever reason, make you who you are and are valuable to our community. And an example of this might be, let's say, um, and, and this is related to a situation I had at Cuesta College with a student of mine who was, his family was um, migrant farm workers and worked so hard. And this young man came up to me and said, you know, I'm having trouble with an English teacher because he looks at my dirty fingernails and he, he, he just treats me poorly because he doesn't think he doesn't think I'm very smart because I work in the fields. And I'm like, well, what if that teacher asked this young man to write a personal narrative about his experiences working in agriculture? And how what if that young man was able to share the, the way his family bonded together and traveled from place to place and how the seasons influence what food shows up where and why things cost what they do in the grocery store. So inviting that in or inviting, like I said, maybe like a really cool thing you wished your, your teacher knew was that your mom was a, an incredible cook and she made these awesome things. My grandma is Italian or she was Italian and she would make these cookies called pizzelis. The whole house would smell like licorice when she'd make these things. And there was all this story that went along with it. And wouldn't it have been cool if my teachers had thought that my immigrant grandma was cool and could learn and share her knowledge with my, with my classmates. So that's why we need culturally sustaining pedagogy. So this right here in the center, if you wanted to buy one book um, or invest in one book, this would be a really good one to go with. Um, and this is where a lot of my information comes from. Uh, the Gloria Ladson Billings, this is one of her books. She recently wrote, she writes a lot and she wrote one on uh, critical race theory in um, education. And then this is the definitive Zaretta Hammond um, book on culturally responsive teaching on the brain. And here's the thing, a lot of folks will, uh, a lot of folks in education will talk about, oh yeah, that's nice to add on. And a lot of folks won't do anything unless you show them numbers that this works. Okay, so if you have administrators like that, get that book right there, culturally responsive teaching in the brain and there's data and numbers and science and it shows how our brains actually respond better when we can connect our learning to something that matters to us. So in Paris and Aleem, that's one thing this workshop isn't. I'm not gonna give you a bunch of um, tips and tricks. I'm giving you some foundational knowledge so maybe you can take it back and, and start weaving it into what you are learning and doing with your students. So they're not in, it's not a quick fix. It's about doing your learning and being an ongoing scholar in this field. And we're all scholars. We're teachers. We are always learning. So why do we need it? I kind of alluded to it. Most of us have been raised um, with a curriculum in the United States that is really centered on the white experience. Uh, this is an area I did a deep dive on in my dissertation uh, and uh, it doesn't really need a deep dive to find really quickly that our curriculum is centered on the white experience. Our history books tell the story of the people who win, right? And from the moment white settlers came onto this continent that we now call North America, we started taking over because it was this doctrine of discovery that we discovered. And because these people lived in a different way and, and had homes that looked different from what things looked like where they came, where the settlers came from, they must not be civilized. Um, and so whiteness became this primacy uh, of, of everything in, on this continent. And 
right here, you will get into an argument, I promise you, with people who will say, oh, no, but that's just how it happened. No, it really isn't, as we're finding out now, and that's something we'll talk about, and I'm going to talk about in a minute, is all this stuff we don't teach, that we get to college and we haven't learned, that I get to be a 50-year-old woman finding out for the first time. I'm more than 50 now, but I'll tell you, there's a lot I've learned in the last few years that I never learned in school. I learned to read from books with pictures like that one right there in the center. And chances are a lot of folks in this call either learn to read or their parents learn to read in the Dick and Jane books, which I don't know if there was ever a, a person of color anywhere <laughs> in those books. And lucky for me, as a first grader in the suburbs in post-war Long Beach, I had a black woman as my first grade teacher, which is very unusual, but lucky for me, I did. Because from that very young age, I saw my teacher, Mrs. Collins, as, as a leader, as a person who knew, who knew me, who knew everything, and I like taught me to read and all of that. Um, so even if it wasn't in the book, I saw her as a scholar and I, and I think that imprinted on me pretty early, but I'm a weirdo in that way. Most people don't have a teacher of color their whole K-12 experience. And if so, it's very rare. So, um, and, and, and that's especially horrible for students of color because we know, and I'm not gonna go down that whole path, but we know there's, the research and the data support that students do better with same race teachers, especially students of color. And that, like I said, I'm not going down that path today, but that is part and parcel of this culturally sustaining pedagogy because in order to get more teachers that are more representative, we have to have people who think they belong in school. If you spend 12 years reading these kinds of books, are you gonna ever find yourself in your curriculum? If all you ever hear is about how your your ancestors were meek and mild and submissive and victims, are you gonna to wanna to participate in your history class? Are you gonna to wanna to do those assignments to just talk about the, the trauma over and over? No, you're gonna check out. And why, are you going to stick with school when your teacher in kindergarten won't let you speak your own language and discounts your, your parents because they are having a hard time coming to events because they work two jobs and that, and then your teacher just assumes they don't care about your schooling when in fact they care desperately and that's why they're working two jobs. So we have to make kids feel like they belong in school if we want them to become teachers. And so that's why it's so important that we integrate this culturally sustaining pedagogies into, um, into our classrooms. So this other thing is the canon. Um, and someone has asked for my dissertation link. I'm happy to provide that once I figure out how to get it. And um, so Cristobal, I'm happy to share that with you, uh, but it's it's hot off the press. So I, will, um, I'll, I can email that to you and add it to a, a link in the slides. Thank you for asking. Um, so yeah, so we're looking at, um, and I'm seeing some great comments here in the chat. It was difficult for me to relate. And we're looking at like this 10 must read classics for high school. So we've been reading the same books for the last 200 years. Who wrote all those books? Well, I would have to say mostly a bunch of old white men wrote those books. They might not have been old when they wrote them, but we need to show the wealth and beauty of the literature that's being written by everyone in this country. And we need to celebrate the deep scholarship. Um, and we need kids to see themselves in the curriculum. Uh, I was trained extremely well to be colorblind in my teacher education. Uh, I got my degree in the late 80s, yeah, I'm that old. Uh, and I was trained very well to be colorblind. I was trained to teach multicultural education but not see color and not distinguish color. And it's the perception of colorblindness, as Benia Silva, te Silva tells us, it comes from the idea that we think that talking about race makes us racist. In fact, if we don't acknowledge our students' 
um, ethnicities and racial identities and other identities, it's like they're invisible. Again, would you stay in a place where you're invisible? Would you want to go there every day? And so that's this is this is another reason for colorblindness. So colorblindness assumes that one size fits all. And this is where I get into talking about the common core standards and assuming that there is such a thing as a standard child. I've never met that standard child, so I might get in trouble for talking about that here, but I'm going to say that even within the common core standards, think about how can you bring in culturally relevant materials, and there's ways to do that, and I'll share some resources with you. Uh, this is another myth. Um, this is another myth that young children are colorblind. Again, busted. Children as young as like three and six months old recognize a difference in skin color and respond to differently to skin color. And we know that in preschool, children are already making their understandings about race. So children are never too young to be talking about, about race and understanding it and, and responding to their natural curiosity about it. My goodness. like. What, why ignore these questions? It's disrespectful to children to not share the truth and to not give them a space to talk about this. And just the other day in my newspaper in San Luis Obispo, one of the whitest places in California right now, um, where in the North County, we have an anti-CRT um, policy at one of our school districts. In our newspaper was an article or an opinion piece that said, how nice to think about when kids are ready to talk about race. What a privilege that is to decide when you talk to your children about race. Black kids talk about it from day one. So I want you to think about that. How young is too young to talk about race? I don't think there is too young. I think it's important for white kids to talk about race so they understand that the, the folks in their community that they're in class with, that they interact with at church or at school or wherever, um, that they understand there's more than just white people around there. Um, so, and then did, am I missing anything in the chat? If someone, if Renee, if you, and if there's something I should address in the chat, just um, unmute. You are not, me. Rosemary. Okay. You are not. David had just asked a question about colorblindness. And oh, so okay. I pulled a definition of what colorblindness is because it's not the colorblind where like there's certain colors. You, it's not like the, the physical challenge that some people are colorblind and there's certain colors they can't see. And it's like a medical condition. I'm just put in like, you know, colorblindness is this idea this ideology that like everybody's the same and therefore it's going to be good. And, and that kind of goes against what you're saying. You know, it really is finding each person's individual um, where they're coming from and meeting them where they are, as opposed to, you know, having them fit into our system. So I just put that in the chat. So David could have that reference if he was interested. Thank you. I know I kind of brushed over that. Thanks Renee. And that's the other thing too, is colorblindness gives us an out as white people to just say, oh, everybody's the same. Everybody, you know, everybody's treated the same, so it must be good. But everybody didn't start from the same spot. And again, that's another talk. We can talk about equity and um, about where people are and the difference between equity and equality. Um, and the important thing here is to understand that if we assume, if we use this term of colorblindness, everybody's the same, it doesn't matter the color of your skin, everybody's equal. You're not acknowledging the historical and ongoing oppression, omission, and erasure of people of color that they deal with, that people deal with, they, because I am white, I say they, deal with on a daily, hourly, by the minute basis. Um, so another term that I find to be very helpful in this situation is color muteness. And Mika Pollock, who is a scholar who is currently at another one of my alma maters at UC San Diego, she coined this in her research, in her initial graduate work about we just don't talk, if we don't talk about it, it's not there. So we talk around race. We don't, but until George Floyd's um, murder in plain sight and the 
uh, activism that evolved from that over this past year, we couldn't even say racism. We couldn't talk about race. I was walking around with the book by Benia Silva and one of my dear friends, nice, wonderful, very generous woman said, can we just not call it racism? Can we talk, can we call it something else? And um, there's a book that just came out by uh, D'Angelo, Robin D'Angelo called Nice Racism, uh, White People. I encourage you to check that out. Um, niceness is not anti-racism, anti-racism. Niceness is glossing over. Um, so if we don't, the again, color muteness is not talking about race. And I challenge you to engage in inquiry and finding out about race, finding out about the kids in your classroom. If you're not teaching yet, I encourage you to learn as much as you can about the history of education in this country. Um, when we talk about erasure and omission, I, I get I get speechless. I the magnitude of the effort to literally exterminate entire civilizations on this continent. It's mind boggling and I don't, I'm not yet grasping the magnitude of it. So I taught fourth grade for years and talking about the mission system. And it doesn't take a whole lot of research to find out what that really was. And what that was, was a way for Europeans to claim land on this continent. And I would argue, use the church as that vehicle by which they did it. And then when they were done building churches, they went to the ranchos, which then monetized the, la the land and put Spanish folks um, in charge of the land in California. And now we're telling the indigenous folks and the folks of Mexico to go back where they came from. White settler colonial folks like me are the people who have invaded. So I want you to think about, I want to invite you to think about that. Um, and then the Indian boarding schools. And again, I had students come to me at, in Quest, at Cuesta and at Cal Poly who had never heard about Indian boarding schools. Um, I didn't learn about them until I was an adult. And we're hearing more about them because of what's going on in Canada and reparations and efforts to, I don't know. The question I have is what school do you know that has a graveyard? They're looking through the graveyards of these schools. Why would you need one? They purposely would kidnap kids from their homes and take them to a school really far away to again, dilute the community. Uh, we could go deep, deep on all this, but we're not. I'm, these are some examples and I invite you to you do your research, find out about this. And the Japanese internment camps as was as Sarah had mentioned earlier um, in the chat. This was an explicit effort to, it was basically a land grab and a property gap, grab, which diluted the generational wealth. And we have a lot of families here in San Luis Obispo who were fortunate enough that their, their neighbors took care of their land for them. But so many people completely lost their heritage, uh, their, their property and their wealth through these Japanese internment camps, um, which were nothing more than concentration camp where people were just taken from their homes and stuck literally in the middle of the desert or halfway across the country, um, coming back to nothing. So, um, and those are just some of the more extreme things. Um, I, I wanna uh, really briefly, if you all, uh, I want you to think again, we'll do another waterfall or you, um, what is something you've learned as an adult that was left out of your K-12 learning? and or how did that make you feel? So I'm gonna give you just a few moments to um, compose a message. And you can be quite frank here. Profanity would not be good, but other than that. All right, three, two, one. How to cite essays, absolutely. The truth of, oh, Thanksgiving. That could be a whole workshop, Renee. 
I actually, I got to tell you, Rosemary, when I was a middle school teacher, I had a principal coming in to do an observation and she said, oh, this is the day I want to come in to observe. And I said, oh, that day I'm going to do a lesson um, about the truth of Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. She was like, and this was years ago, years ago. And she was like, what do you mean the truth of Thanksgiving? Yeah. And so I broke it down for her and I said, you know, we always talk about the Columbus perspective. I said, let's talk about the other perspective and take some true historical documentation and whatnot. And she came in for that lesson and she literally at the end, she said, I can't believe you what, what you just did with fifth graders. Yeah. Yeah. And um, well, it, just to let you know, in my in my research for my dis dissertation, I interviewed white women teachers. And I had um, I had one who had just learned about Thanksgiving. And here's the thing. So this teacher was confronted by a parent in her class. And this teacher, again, nice as, as anything, sweetest woman, very passionately wants to be doing this work. And her response when confronted was, oh, it made me not even wanna do Thanksgiving or talk about Thanksgiving. And that's, that's dangerous because if we respond to hard stuff by avoiding it, it's perpetuating it. And, and it's a very white response to conflict. Uh, and so if you are a white person and you are, and someone raises this idea to you or, or brings something to your attention, it's our immediate response is defense. It's like, oh, but I'm the teacher. I know everything. Take a breath, take a moment and listen to what that person is sharing with you. And maybe they're just literally confused because they don't understand it and it doesn't make sense to them. But, but giving them that space. Um, and then I saw something by that Foxy wrote that I'm gonna use to spin on to the next thing. And all this, yeah, we have Black Panthers. Oh my gosh, Black Panther. Okay, I'm old, I told y'all that. Uh, so I grew up in Long Beach, not far from Compton. And we'll say that my growing up was very much colored by what happened, the Compton uprising. Um, I was taught that the Black Panthers were incredible terrorists and all, and I have learned only in the last 10 years, what really was going on with the Black Panthers and what, what, what they were trying to accomplish. Um, and absolutely, that was left out. All of these, yeah, gun control. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a whole um, story. If you're interested in learning more about the, some of the Black Panthers, there's a great book by Kianga Yamada Taylor called From Hashtag Black lives matter to black liberation. And she talks about the Black Panthers and the situation with them entering the Capitol um, with their guns, because they were allowed to. But where was Foxy's comment? Oh, learning about how so many thriving black communities were literally burned to the ground and the land taken from us. Black and brown communities, absolutely black communities were blatantly um, removed. And we don't want to, we want to look at the history, but not keep it on the history because we need to look at the history as a source for what's going on today. There's a great podcast called Throughline that does that with all sorts of great stuff, all sorts of interesting topics that are going on. And it's, um, it's I want you to keep that in mind. We need the history to start the conversation, but then we need to look at the hope. And what can we want, what can we do to help our students, all our students see the possibilities of these incredible dynamic contributions of these different communities. So consequences of the kind of education we've been giving young people is push out. I don't call it dropping out. And I got that, this from Monique Morris, who writes, um, her book is Push Out, and it's about young women, young Black women, and how they're pushed out by the way they're treated and by the disregard and disrespect they're given. We have this achievement gap, and the achievement gap is um, a teacher education gap, according to, I, I like to think about it in that way, because we're not preparing teachers 
to embrace uh, the cultural wealth of their students. We end up with wealth disparity. I'm just going to tell you because we're running out of time, but did you do you understand that the wealth of a, a middle class black family is one tenth, not like 50%, but a tenth of that of an equally educated and situated white family. Think about that. And that comes from redlining and the history of all of that. Um, we see physiological and mental health impacts of this. So yes, teachers, we have a big responsibility because we can start to change this. We can start in kindergarten and preschool by valuing um, our students. And so how do we do that? Um, this is an infographic from um, something that I presented earlier th this fall. And I think it's really important. We have to be willing to ask questions. We have to be willing to look at our own selves and say, what is my part in this mess? And before we worry about our kids, we inquire, we do our research, we reflect. We go, gosh, I did some bad stuff. I've definitely perpetuated a lot of this stuff myself. So I do my research, how can I do better and act? This part right here is the hard part, I think. Well, no, the whole thing is hard for white people, but especially acting, because that means we were doing something messed up. And, it, and, and one of the traits of, of white supremacy is this idea that everything has to be perfect before you do anything, that you have to know everything, that we don't want to make a mistake. As a white person, I do that all the time. I got called out on this. And so I'm like, okay, fine. I'm not going to wait till it's perfect. I'm going to get as much information as I can, and then I'm going to do it. And sometimes I do it and I get really messed up. And sometimes I do it and it works. Um, but you can't know unless you try. So we can be agents of change. Get to know our students. Why, I, I, I find it interesting that we have to tell people this. Get to know our students, invite in the children and their families and their funds of knowledge. Have family members or caregivers come in and talk about their growing up and their history. Um, be intentional. Look for content that, set, that supports your children's ways of knowing and being. Dr. Bettina Love is one of my, I, I love listening to her. And in her book, We Want to Do More Than Survive, Abolitionist Teaching and the Pursuit of Educational Freedom, in her book, in her TED Talks, in her presentations, she's very adamant that we cannot be serving our students unless they know they matter. How, just think about the fact that we've been raising up young people who don't think they matter. What can you do to make kids matter. Acknowledge the wealth they bring to you. Appreciate their music and their stories and their foods. Celebrate and incorporate ways of knowing and being. Not just Black History Month, we're going to talk about Black, Black people now. Not just, oh, it's, it's Indigenous People um, Awareness Month. We're going to, it's Thanksgiving, we're going to do all our units on Indigenous people, and then that's it, they're done. No, all year long, we're talking about celebrating and acknowledging these accomplishments. There's a brand new book out by one of the people who works who worked with Dr. Um, Paris and Dr. Aline. Her name is Lorena Germain, and I probably did not say her name properly. And she has just written a book called Textured Teaching, where she does go into some of the practical ways of applying culturally sustaining pedagogy. So I encourage you to check out her book um, and it's cited right here. Um, remember and don't ever let somebody at a university tell you that you're not a scholar because if you are teaching every single day, you are observing, you are evaluating and you are testing out strategies with young people. We study student behavior all day long and we adjust our learning activities accordingly. We ask questions and answer them. We discover and implement new strategies and we research and design new curriculum. Even if you have a set common core standard curriculum, you can infuse it with literature. You can infuse it with field trips that bring students culture to the forefront. And I'm citing Drs. Cochran, Smith, and Lytle because they have um, 
They're the ones who made me feel better about being a teacher. I am a scholar every single day um, because I'm researching what works for my students. And that's why I challenge you to approach it that way. Uh, what does it look like to be a culturally sustaining um, educator? It means building relationships. Uh, there is a, a book that I work from called Tribes. And I thought, I, I think it's cited later on in here. And I know tribes is a problematic term, but it's a way of being in the classroom, giving children the opportunity to express themselves and share every day, sitting down in a community circle and finding out how everybody's doing. Just saying, this makes me happy. This makes me sad. Then when, you're, when your class has a conflict and you sit down in a community circle to solve it, it's established. Hey, it's Rosemary, I'm people. wondering, maybe we should do a session at a, at a later time on, <laughs> on community circles. Yeah. Um, because I am a huge proponent of the tribes curriculum and the yeah. methodologies okay. and because mm -hmm. it really gives us um, some tools to enhance communication yeah. in a really authentic way. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's another deep dive. Also, student of the week is something I can't remember if that that's probably from my student teaching at UCLA where it's random, you just pick a different student every week and all week that child gets celebrated and they share, they bring, they get to do a sharing, they bring in stuff that matters to them. And you make a poster about all the cool things about them. And it doesn't matter if they're the child who can't sit still or they're the child who's always acing every, every project. Um, so all of these things build relationships and show children that each other has values. Incorporating family interviews and sharing um, <clears throat> connecting with local personal histories. And in STEM, that's again, a whole nother um, thing. And civic action. Kids are not too young to let their opinions be heard. And that gets into ethnic studies. Again, that's a whole nother project. Uh, I'm gonna just go through these last few slides. <clears throat> so when we have student-centered teaching, um, one size just doesn't fit all. So remember that we, the kids are why we're here, whether they're three years old or 35 years old or anywhere in between. This is why we do what we do. Um, these are some more resources. Oh, here's the link for tribes. Um, this is Liz Kleinroth. Oh my gosh, she's amazing. She just came out with a new book. If you want a, a book that gives you solid things you can walk into your classroom and do, uh, she does a lot with this culturally sustaining pedagogy. And this is a brand new book, um, Start Here, Start Now, with the handouts that you can create on identity maps and um, yeah, everything. So We Need Diverse Books is a great website. There are multiple sites out there where there's multicultural literature, um, very much more representative of all different identities, um, LGBTQIA, uh, different races. And so this is just one of the many sites. The other one that I love is biracial baby, bi biracial bookworms is really cool. Tribes, that's a link there. And this is a link of an ongoing list I've been making of children's literature because I do teach children's literature in a diverse society. And so as I find books, I add them there. Um, and I want us to remember that uh, whoever teaches learns in the act of, in, uh, let's see, learns in the act of teaching and whoever learns teaches in the act of learning. Um, so Paolo Freire, who is one of the core elements or core thinkers in critical pedagogies. Um, I just thought that kind of fit that again, also remembering that we're learning every day in the classroom uh, and let's try to not have that, that hierarchy between the teacher and the student. And let's look at how do we bring the students in and their wealth and validate their knowledge and validate that they are thinkers and um, teachers themselves. Um, so, and, and I wanna leave you with one other uh, comment and it, it's, it's Dr. Gloria Ladson Billing, or no, it's uh, actually is, um, Rudine Sims Bishop, when she talks about children's literature and the importance of representation in the classroom for our young, our young people who, are, who don't normally see themselves represented, it's so important for them to see themselves. 
and the, their accomplishments and the contributions of people who look and act like them. But it's also important for white kids to see because they need to know that there are, there are a lot of other ways to contribute to our community that involve way different ways of knowing and being and to not get an overly valued sense of self. So I'll leave you with that um, as just think about that. Think about what you're inviting when you share and invite in different ways of knowing and being. You're helping these children who have been raised to believe that their privilege is a done deal and that they deserve certain things. And think about what that means when they go on to business. And we wanna raise people who understand different ways of knowing and being um, and they go out and work with folks and that creates a far more dynamic and productive workplace too. So um, yeah, so I am, I think one minute over. Uh, I, I, if there are questions, I can, um, I can. Rosemary, you're actually four minutes early. Oh, okay. You are good. That never okay. happens. <laughs> I love it. Okay. I love it. I love um, it. Well, here's the thing. So here's the link to the slides and uh, many things are hyperlinked in the slides. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, so many, a, a lot of resources are linked in those slides. Uh, my email is in the slides. So feel free to email me um, if you have specific questions. Um, yeah. So um, any, if there are questions, I guess I have a minute or two. That's wonderful. If anybody has a question, either unmute or raise your hand or use the raise hand function. Um, and before we go to questions, Rosemary, I just want to put in a, a little blurb here. Um, I was a big believer in doing community circles in my classroom at all times and at all ages, um, even when I had my college classes. And um, one of the things that I found really valuable, especially when I was at an elementary school campus, um, also this was good at a middle school campus, but we did family potlucks a couple times a year. And it, was, it wasn't like once, and there weren't like, it was always after school in the evening. People could bring whatever they wanted to. So if you were in a situation where financially you couldn't afford to bring a casserole, you could bring a bag of chips. You know what I mean? But but if you were in a situation where you wanted to bring like a cultural meal from your family and your heritage, you could. And we saw over time that doing these potlucks, it just like I literally had somebody who was high up in the union come up to me and say, you know, Renee, I don't know if you should be doing these because you're setting the standard too high for the rest of us. And I said, well, as a new teacher, this is an option that I'm doing. I want to build community. Can I tell you the last potluck I had that year? I had I had a class of 34 students. The last potluck that year, we had over 80 people show up. Well, and Renee, I wanna, I wanna appreciate that because one of the most common things, because I do ask my students in both my, teach, my intro to teaching and my children's literature class and my other intro to teaching class to reflect on um, things that they've experienced throughout their childhood. Every term, I have multiple students talk about how lunchtime was really hard for them um, because the their family would create would uh, their mom would provide them with a meal that was part of their cultural heritage, right? And these often didn't look like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, these often had an aroma that drew a lot of attention to them. And I sit there and I'm like, <clears throat> you know, we need to normalize these things. And, and normal for us is whiteness. That's just all there is to it. Our, our, our educational, political and economic systems are all normed to whiteness and white values. Um, but what a difference like a potluck a community meal has to, it's an opportunity to invite in all these different ways of knowing and find out you might really like something that your that your uh, classmate gets to bring every day, you know? Um, so- Food is like a common ground too. Yeah. It's like, I don't mean to be weird, but it's a, it's a common space. So then people yeah. can feel like, oh, look what I have to contribute. And when it's something from their family and their history, and if you say, hey, why don't you bring in the recipe in case other people want it, you know, they really find value. And when people feel valued, 
that's the that's the secret sauce, right? Yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, and I get into this because I've been doing so much research in this area, talking to people. I'm also working to better understand ethnic studies and develop ethnic studies opportunities for educators because now we have this mandate that we're going to be teaching it and we need to be careful about who's teaching it because if we don't teach ethnic studies properly we end up doing more harm um, in fact i should not be the person teaching ethnic studies but if we don't have people prepared to do that so i think um yeah julie i i wish i could address all of these comments um and have conversations on all of these topics with all of y'all. Um, if you if you want to continue this conversation, message me, email me, ask for topics for future conferences like this. Um, I'm so grateful that we had so many people in this conversation today. And again, I want to acknowledge that my understanding of these things comes from research and interactions. I do not have, I had a very privilege growing up. Um, yeah, I had everything I ever needed. I had access to school. I mean, we lived modestly, but I had access to school. I had access to clothes and food. My parents still live in the same house I was brought home to from the hospital. Um, and I am growing in my understanding. So certainly I speak from that perspective and I invite critique and um, appreciate when folks are willing to let me know if I've misstated or misrepresented um, something, please let me know. But I thank you all for being here. I have hope for the future because you're here, because you care. Rosemary, I know we're wrapping thank right you, now, but Rose. Sarah just put something really powerful in the chat. She said, I think in a lot of situations, if someone white isn't teaching ethnic studies, people won't listen. That's, um, that's and Sarah, I appreciate you saying that. I actually am doing a, I'm working this uh, December, I'm doing a series on teachers of color for a group called Joint Special Population. And it was really interesting because this is an area that I've specialized in for a while, diversifying the teacher pipeline. And my colleague who runs the group said, you know, I think it's gonna be more legit if you work together with Lisa Wilson on this. And Lisa Wilson is a, is a leader in this area. And she's also a colleague of mine who's African-American. And so to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, I get to work with Lisa. That's just gonna enrich this going to make it better for all of us. So I'm not sure, I, and I don't agree with who the keepers of knowledge are in our system. Our hierarchy is alive and present. Um, but I think as long as we continue to have these conversations and be willing to challenge and, and bring people in or step back at times and let other, you know, help others to move forward. It's complicated. It's complicated but um, it's worth the work. So I know, Rosemary, we are on time right now. Thank you so much for all Thank you're doing, you. Rosemary. And I've got to say, for anyone who's on right now, come back tomorrow. Rosemary is our opening presenter tomorrow morning as well. Yeah. And so um, we'd love to see you then. Any last words, Rosemary, before we wrap for today? Just on that ethnic studies thing, to get ethnic studies underway, it's people are going to have to tolerate white folks jumping in because we are the massive population but then we need to be ready to step back. And so that's that's where I am in this. I kind of like pushed to get a ball rolling and now I'm stepping back to let other folks be there, but like to be in the in the army not the not the sergeant or whatever the, I don't know I don't know um military terms but you know to to be willing to step away because we've had the limelight for plenty of time. So Thank you, everyone. Uh, message me if you have questions and have a great rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Everybody, we have our next session starting at 10 a.m. So please jump on that link. If anybody's yeah. missing it, just shoot me an email and I'll make sure I send it to you as soon as I can. Have a great rest of your Teach for LA, everybody.